Hi, everyone. How are you? Having a good time, right? Okay, we got a few people coming in. I'm Lori Bettison Varga. I am the president and director of your natural history family of museums. And we're so proud to be working tonight uh, with Knock Knock and the launch of Jen Billick's new book. Okay, the title is really cool. This is Not LA, an insider's take on the real Los Angeles, debunking the cliches, crushing the haters, and generally making you wish you lived here or happier that you already do. What a great title. Uh, we're so excited to be working with you, Jen. Um, for those of you who don't know Jen, she is the CEO and founder of Knock Knock, an LA-based independent maker of gifts and publisher of books. She is a writer, editor, creative director, and crafter, among many other things, including really, really, really enthusiastic about Los Angeles, of course. Um, I just wanted to say that we thought this was a perfect program for us to have. Uh, because, um, drum roll, I don't know how many of you knew this, but the Natural History Museum has an LA history collection. <laughs> Woo, right? That's, that's the big news. It's big news to a lot of people that we have an exhibit called Becoming Los Angeles, which we recently reopened a few months ago. Uh, it's, it was opened five years ago. We've reopened it, refreshed it. It's really terrific. It's open. How many of you gotten, gotten to look in there? Okay. So the rest of you get in there before the night is over. It's really, really fabulous. And a couple of things really stood out to me in the book as I was going through it. I need to read every word. I haven't had a chance to. But speaking of becoming Los Angeles, debunking the myth about our population, I love the reality check that our remarkable diversity really is a strength. And that's how the Becoming Los Angeles exhibit ends now. It is about the strength of our diversity. And we're really proud to be a part of that story here. And of course, the other favorite part I have at the end, which is all about LA doesn't have a history, but it, it really does, is the showcase on La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. <laughs> Woohoo! So what you might not have known, number two, is that the natural history family of museums includes the La Brea Tar Pits, which is the only place like it in the world. Tell your friends. So uh, we're really, really excited to have the program, to have this fabulous uh, panel put together. I want to give a really uh, great big shout out to our community science and history departments that put some wonderful displays out for you to remind you that we do have collections and a lot of them. Second largest collection in the United States at your natural history family of museums. All right. so. <laughs> Just a little plug for LA and museums. So with no further ado, Jen, please come on up. This whole night is a big plug for LA and right before I came up, I spilled on myself. But it's just water, just in case you're wondering. Thank you so much for hosting us. Natural History Museum and Dr. Bettison Varga, just we couldn't be in a better place. And to see Becoming Los Angeles relaunched, I saw it in 2013 when it was here, and I thought to myself, why is this not, why is there not a permanent exhibit dedicated to the city of Los Angeles like this? And to and we didn't even know when we approached the museum about you know having this event with us. And when they told us, we were like, no way. And they said, way. And so, so that's how it all, it all began. Um, so creating this book, which has such a long title that I even typed it wrong <laughs> in my notes. But thankfully, I don't have to say it again because it's, it's already been said. And one of Knock Knock's mottos is, why use fewer words when you could use more? Which comes straight from the head, I mean, of the fish. Um, so it was a true labor of love, both the labor and the love, which nobody understands better than my amazing co-author, Kate Sullivan, who is, yeah! <laughs> Oh, there she 
is, there she is. I was like looking around. <laughs> So yeah, there's my Kate. Okay, so you know, being from the Bay Area and New York City, or not from, but living there, like I basically absorbed the double dose of like Los Angeles sucks, right? And I took it for granted for so many years that it was almost a truism, that it was reflexive to disparage Los Angeles. And clearly often by people who didn't know anything about Los Angeles, they say about some bosses, their seagull bosses, you know, they fly in, they poop, and they leave. And that's the case with a lot of people who have come to Los Angeles. Long history of people who fly in, don't want to be here, they're here temporarily. They experience and generate self-fulfilling prophecies of what the city is, and then they complain about it, which is about as boring as talking about the weather, even our weather, because one-dimensional stories are boring. Mm -hmm. We have like 1.25 dimensions tonight, so maybe 1.3. Um, so in the process of writing a book about this dynamic, fascinating, world-class city, Kate and I came to this crucial question only at the very end of the book, which was, has Los Angeles changed or only its reputation? And the answer, we think, is both. But it was kind of interesting. All of the myths, there are 18 myths in the book that we debunk, and all of them talk about Los Angeles past, present, and because we are psychic future. Um, you know, uh, we didn't actually kind of come to this sum of like, has LA changed or does the reputation? And the answer is both. Um, so I believe that the city changed first, but its reputation didn't catch up. Um, sort of in its white European urbanized incarnation, Los Angeles is indeed a young city. And so many of the amenities and dynamics of a city on the East Coast or European or even the San Francisco um, model were not here in the first half of the 20th century when everybody started bitching about it. Um, but to fail to recognize what this land has been for so many people and what the city now is, is I think negligent, especially when it's coming from periodicals of records such as the New York Times don't boo, um, <laughs> that would not allow itself such slips on other topics. Um, and indeed, it was actually the New York Times that partly inspired this book as I began to question why it was okay to mock Los Angeles, whereas like, it wasn't okay to mock New York, it wasn't okay to, for me to visit my college friend in Holland, Michigan and mock especially Holland, Michigan. Um, but from living here for um, over two decades, I already knew that much of it was not based in fact, or it was based in facts that were either very out of date or um, shudderingly exaggerated. I like to use the word shudder, um, or both. Um, and this book is not a rosy-eyed vision of Los Angeles. Uh, we really wanted this to be truth, not idealization. Like, are the myths true? So for example, like if people say, oh, there's such a gap between rich and poor. Yes, there is, but you know what? It's less than New York and San Francisco. It's not that it's not a bad thing. It's that we, you can't blame, like why are we being singled out for it? Because being defensive is a really attractive trait. Um, <laughs> So a lot of what we were looking at was in how many cases is Los Angeles so much worse than cities, other cities in the US and in the world. And it turns out very few. Um, and the features that make Los Angeles so glorious had been widely undersung. And Los Angeles therefore has occupied this really weird position of being this giant megalopolis Goliath that has had to assume this David-like, you know, we're tiny and we need defense. Um, that wasn't how I wrote it on this, but that's how it came out. Um, we were 
beyond fortunate to have the food and culture writer Jonathan Gold contribute a beautiful foreword to this book. And if you've been into the Becoming Los Angeles exhibit, uh, you'll know that the documentary on him, City of Gold, is playing at the end of the exhibit on loop. And that's not a permanent part of the exhibit, though maybe after tonight it will be. Um, it is in honor of him and his contributions to this city and you know, on a very small scale to this, in, to this book. We were so fortunate to have him. And as I think everybody here knows, he played a primary role in updating our view of Los Angeles and in updating our own self-images as Angelinos. Because how many of us like make the jokes about ourselves before other people make like we're like oh yeah I live in the land of silicone I didn't write that here either um, you know and when we lose many public figures it's something that happens out there but every once in a while a public figure comes along where we experience their loss as someone in our family or among our friends and Jonathan Gold's loss is the latter um, I had been reading his work for years, and I, but I'd never met him, and I was very much looking forward to, to meeting him when this book was ready to share, and I think we all feel he should be here tonight. Kate, the book's co-author, worked with Jonathan and his wife, Lori Ochoa, at the LA Weekly, and experienced them, as so many fortunate writers did, as patron saints. But Kate notes that Jonathan was not a saint, he was a real man and a great man with all the glinting jagged edges and glowing rounded horizons you could ever ask for a mentor or a city. He was as complex and textured as LA itself. Jonathan's loss is a devastation for us all and yet, and I know I am not alone in this, I feel him all around me now as I drive in LA and walk and lie on the ground looking up at the sky. I see him in swirling, flocking freeway birds, maybe seagulls, and in the dingy wood grain Formica tabletops at Sapped Coffee Shop in Thai Town. I believe Jonathan's soul is free now to be in all places at once versus the green pickup truck in Alhambra and Venice and Sherman Oaks and Crenshaw and Hollywood and Cerritos and Koreatown in Pico Union and Watts and Brentwood and Lakewood. I hope he feels some satisfaction in this super mobility, which to be honest, who wouldn't? Um, mm -hmm. That's our cape. Tonight we hope and trust that Jonathan's newly portable soul um, is here with us right now. And one manifestation of that is our good fortune in having Jonathan's good friend, Evan Kleiman, considered by so many to be the fairy godmother of the LA food scene, to read his forward and say a few words. Hello. Oh, I'm short. Um, when Jen contacted me to ask me to read uh, Jonathan's foreword, um, I had really mixed feelings. Um, I feel like part of my new life is to represent Jonathan um, to the community in so many ways, to be present and to um, shine lights on places that um, need a light shown on and to um, constantly defend the city we love. Uh, but pretty much every time I think about him now, I start to weep. So if that happens, please forgive me. Um, like Jonathan, I'm an LA native. I was born in Pico Rivera and I grew up in Silver Lake. And by some weird, um, strange, synchronicity, um, I too played the cello for years, and I too have a truck that I still drive. Um, and I feel like the two of us had a shorthand of understanding the city through food, and I was so incredibly like blessed to have the gift of a standing appointment with this man every week to get to just riff on what we loved the most. Um, so here we go. These are Jonathan's words. When you live in Los Angeles, you're used to having your city explained to you by others, often by people who parachute in from out of town and write about what they find within 20 minutes of their West Side hotels. Los Angeles is the edge of the continent. 
populated by happy people with good teeth who all drive convertible BMWs or vintage Mustangs. We carry yoga mats around with us and drink $14 glasses of emerald tinted juice. We're not all in show business, that would be impossible because some of us have to teach Pilates. Wax or... <laughs> I love him. Uh, because some of us have to teach Pilates, wax surfboards, or refurbish the cute little bungalows in Echo Park that are snapped up by photographers from New York. I don't mind the outsider's idea of Los Angeles, to tell you the truth. Sometimes it's fun to sit on the patio at Jelena, among TV actors and vacationing Condé Nast editors. The pizza's really good, even when they put grilled radicchio on it. Parties at those Hollywood Hills mansions with the infinity pools and views out to Catalina Island are nice. I prefer earthquakes to blizzards, Santa Ana's to nor'easters, and palm trees to sickly elms. Have you ever surfed? It's fun. But the Los Angeles that most of us live in is a different beast entirely, a city of almost unimaginable unimaginable diversity, the world center not just of entertainment at the moment, but of aerospace and art. If you drive through Compton on the right day, you really can see lowriders bounce. When President Trump tried to scare Americans with visions of a taco truck on every corner, we sighed with delight. <laughs> we get to celebrate Chinese New Year here, Visak. Eid, Tet, Dia de los Muertos, Nowruz, and a whole lot of holidays I'm forgetting. Kwanzaa was actually invented here. San Francisco likes to think of Los Angeles as the place where civilization went to die. We think of San Francisco as a pleasant place to spend a weekend. New Yorkers write endless think pieces on the difference between our city and theirs, but we smile. Moving to Silver Lake is probably the most Brooklyn thing it's possible to do at the moment, and we just absorb their culture into the vast, glittering mosaic. <laughs> Alongside a Koreatown so closely tied to the motherland that it may as well be a suburb of Seoul, San Gabriel Valley Chinese neighborhoods that stretch for 20 miles and a Mexican population that's almost twice the size of Guadalajara. La Los Angeles is where you get to reinvent yourself every day if you want, where you can slip through a rabbit hole and find yourself in an Iranian recording session, a sleepy Nigerian dining room, or a bar designed after a favorite haunt in distantly remembered Pyongyang. Within 15 minutes of my house, in Pasadena, I can hike a mountain trail, hang out with people whose job it is to monitor the weather on Mars, find food from regions of China I'm not sure I can find on a map, spend a day at the track, sip tea with blue bloods, or eat heaps of Jalisco-styled fried chicken necks. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you. Panelists, come on up. So first we've got Patty Rodriguez. Is it okay if I say this while you guys are walking, like as if you're modeling Los Angeles? Um, so Patty Rodriguez is, is a first-generation Mexican-American, which I think is important to note because this crucial part of our city has gone either unacknowledged or disparaged and misunderstood for so many years. She is a true force. She's a senior producer for many years on uh, on, on air. Got that double on trip, yep. On on air with Ryan Seacrest and a multiple entrepreneur, most recently launching the award-winning bilingual children's book imprint Lil Libros. And she's a native. Yay, Patty! Okay. Next we've got Linnell George, a journalist and essayist who has just released her second book. What's that Ooh. like? Um, after Image, Los Angeles Outside the Frame, 
a volume of essays and photography published by another local imprint, Angel City Press. I have to give a shout out to us LA publishers. We also have Prospect Park books in the house. No, we are not all in New York. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's been a staff writer for the LA Times and LA Weekly, is a contributing columnist for KCAT's Artbound, and in any writer's dream, she won an Emmy for writing kick-ass liner notes. <laughs> Linnell is also a Los Angeles native. Alyssa Walker is wearing a beautiful, no, um, is a, <laughs> a journalist and activist on the issues of walking and public transit. And her blog, so she had this, these blog posts, hater rating, like hate rating, um, that actually partially inspired this book where she assigned points to uh, publications like New York Times, New Yorker, Vanity Fair, for how many tired tropes they could assign to LA rather than doing, you know, actual journalism. <laughs> and that was part of what I was like, oh my God, I don't have to take this for granted. Why do they do this? And that was Alyssa's <laughs> hater rating. Um, she co-founded the nonprofit Design East of La Brea, which I only late learned it's pronounced D-Lab, not De La B. Um, I like that better. That's yeah. better. Um, and like Linnell, Alyssa has been named a USC Anna Murgetti Arts Journalism Fellow, and she's currently the urbanism editor at Curbed, not like Linnell. Um, and uh, Alyssa starts out our transplant uh, contingent on this panel. She moved to LA, she grew up in St. Louis and did time in Colorado and Atlanta, and uh, moved to LA in 2001. Finally, we have Ed Leibowitz. A veteran long-form magazine writer for many publications on diverse topics including entrepreneurship, actors and filmmakers, politicians and political activists, architects and architects, no, architects and artists, homelessness, and basically everything that matters to our lives. Um, as a writer at large for LA Magazine, he won the Penn USA Journalism Award for a story about the Los Angeles Public Schools. And Ed is um, joins Alyssa on the transplant team, because this is actually going to be a debate and a competition. I haven't told them yet. Um, who came to LA in 1997 from, where do you think? Yeah! Is that, is that just because he's Jewish like I am? No, 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 no. I, all my people come from New York, too, of course. But, um, and now it is the t Oh, my chair is already here. Oh. My husband has this shipped in via Amazon by the case in case anybody drops by. He thinks it's environmental. I'm like, you're having it shipped in. <laughs> But it's better. But I love her. It is better. Yeah, it is better. It's better. That's what it said. Okay. <laughs> Minimal. So, my first question for all of you is why do you live in LA? Not why the hell do you live in LA, but oh my God, why do you live in LA? I can start. <laughs> Linnell. Um, well, I'm a native. And that was really important in the very beginning. You know, it was like, this is where family is. This is my story. This is all of my connections. It's actually very significant being here in this room because I grew up in this museum and I took Saturday classes, uh, science classes. You know, I, I, because I save everything. Um, <laughs> I even had my little notebook where I had taken a, it was a, class on ornithology or so I actually had the the down and the eider down and feathers and all these things in this little notebook so this is all significant like being in this place um but what I realized is as a journalist I when I became well when I decided I wanted to be a writer there was something really important to me about being a writer and telling the story of this place that was really important because I felt like everybody's getting it wrong. And it's not, LA is not what is sort of floating out there as it is. And so I, I, part of the reason I ended up being a journalist was because I wanted to tell the story of this place. So that's why I'm still here. <laughs> that is such a good reason. Thank you. 
I love that. Mine's the same, I think. Well, I mean, I wasn't born here. I didn't grow up in this museum. But um, <laughs> I grew up in St. Louis, which I always, is anyone from St. Louis? You are? Oh, oh my God. OK. Well, so you know. I mean, you don't know what I'm going to say. But I always felt like I lived in a city that didn't, well, I didn't live in the city. I live in the suburbs of a city that everyone was afraid to go to that I knew. So it was, uh, if you went downtown, it was dangerous. If you went beyond your green suburban world, it was dangerous or um, not where you wanted to be. And I always wanted to go to the city and see what was going on down there. And um, luckily I had parents that did take us down there and did amazing things with us. But I always felt like I wanted that urban experience. And um, when I grew up and after I did my time, as you said, in, uh, in other places, I knew I wanted to move to a really big city. But I also did never in my mind thought I would move to LA because of all the stereotypes, because of all the horrible things that I, in my mind, thought happened here. Like I was going to be Malibu Barbie. I always wanted to be Malibu Barbie, and I don't know why. I did not know where Malibu was, and then once I found out, I was like, well, I don't actually want to move there. But when I came here, I realized it was so much more than that. And just like you said, I... I came here thinking I was going to work in advertising, but I very quickly realized that I needed to tell the stories of what was happening here, and maybe to the people in St. Louis to tell them not to be afraid of their own cities or anywhere that you live, that it's about diversity and it's about being able to walk down a street in a different neighborhood and talk to people. And um, as soon as I started doing that, my whole perspective changed on my whole life, not just LA, but I, once I got out of the car and you know, started to foster those relationships, that's when everything changed for me and that's when I started writing about. So I don't know where else I would go. Where else would you go? I don't know. <laughs> I, I live here in the city because my, my family, my parents chose the city as the place where the American dream actually happens. Uh, both my parents are Mexican immigrants they came here in the 80s undocumented, um, and they chose this place, and they called it home, because it felt like home. Uh, uh, growing up, I grew up in an all-Spanish household. English is actually my second language, even though I was born here, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I'm, the f I'm the first to be in this museum from the family. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, to, to me, my L.A. is my Latino community, and um, I was just telling Jen, we're 50% of the population in the this, in this city, and I, I feel like it's a responsibility to be standing on this stage and share who I am and what we do, and, and um, the contributions that we make to the city are far greater than what, you know, what do we see with our eyes. And um, I'm very grateful that my parents chose this city uh, to call it home, and now it's home to my children. And it's so beautiful to see when I drop off my kids the diversity, diversity we have, African American, he has African American friends, uh, Asian American friends, and, and they, they're bilingual. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's a beautiful, it's, I don't, I wouldn't change this city at all. It, it has its flaws, but it's, it's the most beautiful city in the world, I believe. So when I first came out here, um, my I had lived in New York for about ten years before this, and you know I have I came like a stuffed chicken over stuff with cliches about LA and how it was. <laughs> um, but fortunately, um, one of my best friends from college lived in Koreatown, and we just had this immersion in this incredible surprising to me world within a world and uh, you know we had fugogi and you know we just kind of wandered around the streets and there were these mini malls where like you know nothing was you know in English it was all in Korean and uh, about five years later I think um, the Japan uh, Korea Olympics uh, not Olympics it was the uh, World Cup was on and uh, I went out to Koreatown with a friend of mine who's a big soccer hooligan, and we were at three in the morning um, on Wilshire, just marching down Wilshire between um, uh, Vermont and Normandy. It's, and it's when Korea actually had beaten Poland. It was a huge game. And 
three in the morning, it was so completely alive and celebratory, and we just got caught up in this incredible energy and this incredible pride. And then strangely enough, um, before the Olympics were, Olympics, I keep saying, before the World Cup was over, I'm not a big soccer fan, I'm sorry, but uh, I was that year. Um, I actually did a travel article in Korea and I went to Seoul and it was, it was literally like being on Wilshire and Vermont again. It was just a continuation of this incredible, I don't know, energy and beauty. And uh, I guess that was my introduction to LA. Um, and I stayed, of course. I feel like if LA needs bumper stickers, <laughs> we're totally coming up with all of them tonight. And, you know, LA has good bumpers. Um, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> what have you guys found to be the most misunderstood thing about Los Angeles? And part B. Why do you think people hate on L.A. so much or love to hate on L.A. so much? That I think for me, one of the big, biggest misconceptions of L.A. is that as Latinos, they think that we're just your nannies and your gardeners and your drivers. Mm -hmm. um, we're more than that and we're, you know, and uh, we're contributing a lot more now as we become first, second generation Americans. And, um, and I and I and I think that stereotype has a lot to do with media. You know, that's that's really subconsciously that's where we get. You know, we it 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 affects how we think and the way we think. And um, that's the biggest misconception I think mm -hmm. in this city. Um, and the fact that we're all Mexican, we're not all Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> I actually looked it up. It's uh, 32 percentage points Mexican um, descent and 16 percentage points. I don't think those add up to 50. Wait, no, 52. S something like that. But it, I was interested that it was basically two thirds, one third. My math is terrible. Um, <laughs> One of my favorite facts in the book, actually, especially given the political climate that we're in right now, is that uh, immigrants uh, commit disproportionately way less crime than people who've lived in the States for a long time. And actually, the longer you live in the US, the more likely you are to, to commit a crime. Just all these different misconceptions, you know? And again, we were looking to debunk myths with facts, and that was one of my and I commit crimes. I've been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, no crimes. But when I, <laughs> except that I did, I lived, I lived outside of Los Angeles for a certain amount of time. Criminal. <laughs> I lived in San Francisco. Ooh. Okay, that's okay. Ooh. And it was, I was sort of like, you know, kind of, under, you know, uh, like, it wasn't like I was planning to, like, be undercover, Angelino, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was in graduate school, and I was in a creative writing program, and so I started writing about L.A. in this creative writing class, uh, master's program, and people were like, you're from L.A.? you don't seem like you're from LA. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And, and this idea too that like, well, oh, well, it's good. It, it's good that you got out of there. This is good for you that you got out of there. And, and that does seem to be still something I battle, you know, or as it, you know, as I, I mean, I don't, I've kind of given up. I just thought if you want to come like more than halfway, I will help you, <laughs> you know. But that, like to, like yeah. to the San Luis Obispo, you mean, or you yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> if you cut halfway, we'll clean. get you out. Exactly. Yeah. We'll get you out. <laughs> so, would you say it's a misconception that people live here by choice? Like when people are like, "Oh, you got out." Yes, I mean that was the thing, and, and this, uh -huh. and also this idea that, like, you know. Get back to the cultural wasteland and that point that Jonathan makes um, and has made so eloquently about like, you know, so many people come here and they just plunk down and they're in a hotel near the airport or 
I, you know, when I was teaching, I was at some faculty meeting and, and some woman had moved from across the country and she was in faculty housing. So she was in a, con she was in a concrete box, you know, with no view and she was like, oh, LA is horrible. Well, LA demands, you know, as warm and as friendly as we are as Angelinos, you know, it can be as Angelinos. LA though demands that you participate. You have mm. to be an active participant in your experience here. Mm -hmm. And we help out, you know, and we'll, but it's like, you've got to kind of be part of making your life. And that's the thing, I yeah. think, is this, this idea mm -hmm. that like, oh, there's nothing. Well, you've got to be part of your adventure. You choose your ally. It is a choose your own adventure city. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. is. <laughs> Yeah, I think you go to other cities, and this is could be anywhere, but like things happen to you, mm -hmm. and maybe here, unless you seek things out, like, it won't happen in the same way because of all different reasons. But I think it's funny because like we've been on panel, we've been at events mm -hmm. before where like we're like the walking people, right? We're like, the walking oh, people. This is <laughs> like exactly. we invited the people who <laughs> like to walk around, like me and Linnell, like we're the only people. But it's. It, it is like, that's a really big part of it, I think. And, yes, I, and so many absolutely. people will never get that experience because right. they just won't ever right. do it. Yeah. And I think that that's a big key to the choose your own adventure. And yeah. I do think that um, it, it was like poo-pooed on to move here up until recently. And mm -hmm. now for some reason, all these people want to come live in Silver Lake. Right. I don't, for the life of me, I don't understand. I mean, great, no, Silver Lake's great. But like, I don't understand like why all of a sudden it's all switched and... We want people to love it but not move here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I want them to appreciate it and write better articles about it, but just stay, yeah. stay where you are. We love it but yeah. you won't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's important to reinforce every bad cliche to visitors. Yeah. The book is terrible. <laughs> so, so you can yeah, keep I mean, them out. Joke, right? arms yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I, I thought one of the most... Uh, um, incredible canards was the fact that LA uh, doesn't have a past or mm -hmm. destroys its yes. past. Yes. And, you know, I lived in by Times Square in the 80s and it was kind of gritty and it was kind of unusual. And by the time I left New York, there was like, you know, Disney palaces and a cheesecake factory. <laughs> and, and basically it looked like a suburban shopping mall on 42nd Street. And then I, I came down to LA's downtown and there were just all these incredible theaters, all this incredible architecture that luckily because LA had the space, um, they just left there um, and built somewhere else. So there was all this sort of historical resonance to places. And I, I also found in New York, like um, now it's the case in Brooklyn too, where most neighborhoods are defined by what tax bracket you're in. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, I mean, you know, there's no sort of, you know, Lower East Side Yiddish sort of quality to the Lower East Side anymore. Um, Yorktown really doesn't have, you know, any sort of, you know, German, you know, historical presence. And, you know, again, it's it's sort of like Rite Aids and, uh, you know, and uh, I don't know, Crate and Barrel every three, you know, three yards <laughs> in Manhattan. But, um, I was talking with my wife and it was funny, we, we went to uh, the Warner Brothers lot once and I remember I was just standing there on you know, one of the street scenes and I'm like, I finally, finally found the real authentic New York. It was on the <laughs> Warner Brothers lot and it wasn't in New York anymore. Um, so in terms of the relative authenticity of the two places, I, I think that's backwards. <laughs> I was listening to um, a conversation between Linnell and Evan before the event started, and I was talking to Patty earlier today, and, and both were touching on negative change. You know, like um, I was talking with Patty about gentrification, mm -hmm. and Linnell and Evan were talking about um, neighborhoods not having the same uh, sort of cohesive and, and sort of char individual character quality that they once had. and. I come up against this, all. change is inevitable, you know? Right, right. And if you're gonna resist change all the time, you're just gonna be an unhappy human right. being. Um, what do you see in, what are some good ways to change and some, and some maybe not positive ways to change? Like we agree no cheesecake, cheesecake factory <laughs> in Times Square. We can all agree on that. Um, but how do, we, how do we moderate or temper 
the change that is inevitable and not just complain about it. Yeah. God, I think for in our community, gentrification has really affected us. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that our communities deserve better infrastructure, deserve uh, quality food, mm -hmm. but not at the expense of the locals and their their livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing this just this where they're getting displaced, the rents are beyond what they can f even afford. And it's heartbreaking uh, to see that. And, um, and in, I suppose instead of pushing them out, giving our community the tools and the resources for them to create the American dream, that's where they're here. And instead we're pushing them away and you know, it, it hits me personally because I have friends and family who are affected by it. Mm -hmm. I'm just not watching it in the news. I'm like, oh, poor soul. No, I'm concerned. It, it's affecting me. And, and it's not something that's happening in another country. It's still happening in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we are turning the other way because it's, it's you know, and, and, and that's the problem with many of us. We're like, oh, it doesn't happen to me. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I'm the, I want that... Uh, uh, that that house on uh, on Vernon, you know, by the 110 next to USC, because you know I can flip it's it. It's convenient to the Natural yeah, History I Museum. I can flip it. <laughs> <laughs> I can flip it and displace, you know, the people that have been there for, you know, the, the brown and the black folks. That's really who it's right. affecting. Right. Um, and I think instead of uh, going there and I don't want to use this word, but colonizing it. Yeah give us the tools and the resources right. to work with each other right. and make LA what it should be, a diverse community. Right. It's true. It's true. When, when I was doing the research for my um, recent book, uh, After Image, I spent most of last spring and summer going to uh, community meetings, um, working with, like, like people sitting like, oh, okay, so like, you know, renters unions and how do we keep our place as our place? Mm -hmm. You know, we understand the change is inevitable. We, we understand that, but how can we stay and be part of a community? Because for me growing up here, part of the reason I was in love with LA is that you can have a little bit of the whole world by mm -hmm. moving through it. Mm -hmm. And you learn and it augments who you are. You, you have your own place in the world, and, and, and you are a better, um, you're a better person because you can you know, move into spaces. And that, that part is being flattened, I feel. You know, our, our neighborhoods, which were distinct, you know, um, there's a flattening of place, and things start to feel the same. So some of the discussions that I've been noticing that are now finally starting to happen, and this is the problem, they're only discussions. Hopefully that it can turn into action. But yeah, how do we bridge, like, you know, okay, if we're gonna, ha if you are moving into this place this, that is so unique and has this flavor, can we do something to keep this flavor instead of just turning it into whatever your dream was? Like you couldn't afford a house in X community, so you're gonna make this, you know, your house that looks like this other place? And, you know, and how do you interact with your neighbors? And if you're gonna create a business, can you create a business that brings in the entire community um, that serves so you can have conversations? Because when I moved into Echo Park, I was the only, I was the only African American woman on my street. But I met my neighbors quickly and they were inviting me over, and I was learning about all the different cultures there. Curiosity, to me, is the strength mm -hmm. of Los Angeles. Yes. Mm -hmm. Coexisting. Coexisting, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not being afraid of each other. Yeah, yeah. don't be afraid. <laughs> and I, I think that, that that's the, probably the biggest concern for me, writing for a place like Curbed, where pretty much what we write about is changing cities, yeah, you know, yeah. what, and it's not that we're writing about these developments because we think they're the best ideas for certain neighborhoods, it's just they're happening and like people need to know about what's going on if they want to stop them or make them better or make sure that they're you know, an active voice. 
And from my very professional opinion as a transplant who only moved here 17 years ago, I don't have the same level of ownership, but if you have the means to make more room in the neighborhood where you live by changing the zoning or making sure the transit serves it better or making sure the access to schools is protected, you have a responsibility to let more people from the city to live closer to you, perhaps on top of you, perhaps next to a train line that comes through your backyard and allowing a bike path to be connected from the east side to the west side of the city. Um, there's things like this happening in our city right now where people who have a lot of money are blocking these opportunities and this, this access that should be granted to everybody equally across the city. So my shout out would be to, if you know of these projects that are happening in your neighborhood and you know of like, a, a supportive housing center that's being proposed or a place where people could park their RVs to safely sleep at night because they don't have a place to live. Go out and support those things and let your neighborhood become a place where more neighbors are welcome instead of shutting people out. So um, when I first moved into Eagle Rock, um, the uh, I think the, the biggest gourmet restaurant there was Sizzler. <laughs> and, it's one of my favorites. And it was an incredible community, and it was very diverse. I mean, I, I actually sat on a porch with a guy called Oki Adams, who was a guy with three teeth who had come like with, you know, from the Dust Bowl. And someone told me he could sell me a banjo, and he had made like two banjo necks in 40 years. And so he tried to sell me a banjo neck, not the rest of the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was much more diverse, and um, and we're fortunate in that we live on a hill where there, there's a, a large development just above us of uh, five-bedroom houses, and the neighborhood was mostly Filipino when we, we got there, and one of the reasons it was so attractive to extended Filipino families was that you'd have like three or four generations living there, and most of those families still are in those houses and they're never gonna sell. Um, I don't see how without some kind of really aggressive um, uh, public government intervention, you're gonna be able to stop this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the biggest leverage is people are making so much money from real estate now mm -hmm. that if you can require a very aggressive inclusive, inclusive housing ordinance, so that maybe 25% of the units have to be affordable units, right. and they'll still make a killing on the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. That might be a way to preserve it, but it's mm -hmm. so hard. I mean, um, at my son's school, uh, he was going to public school, and um, I was talking with a family, and uh, they were um, a Mexican-American family, and they had bought, like, in, I think, the, uh, the 50s, and they bought their house for, like, $30,000, and, you know, one time, the mom was like so excited. I was like, what's up? And she said, well, I just sold our house for like, you know, $800,000 and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get to travel for the first time in our lives. We're gonna get to, you know, put a grandkids through college. And so it, it's so hard to tell people not to do that and it's impossible right. legally to get them not to do that. Right. Um, but I think just public intervention is, is really necessary in this yeah. regard. So last question um, before you guys are thronged by <laughs> questions from the audience. Um, in the last month, what surprised you about Los Angeles? Ooh, ooh, that's a, ooh. Ooh. Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what was the date? So what's today? Today is the, so this would be August the 20th. August, August, August 20th. 20th. After Unless August. it's lunar. <laughs> in all honesty, yeah. like really being super honest, that I even got invited to do this. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. In all honesty. Oh. <laughs> Is it terrible that I say you were my first? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually happy that I am. Yeah. Because you got a good one. Oh, totally. <laughs> no, I didn't mean terrible for you. I meant terrible for them. <laughs> yeah. I'm the token male on this panel, so I yeah. know I was dead last. <laughs> See, you're la you got asked last, yes. obviously. Yes. They're like, oh, No, I mean, it's good for you that you were first. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's a compliment. 
I, I will just say, just after hearing Evan, after crying my eyes out hearing Evan read Jonathan's uh, story, like going to um, his public memorial, that if, did any of you go to that? That was in Grand Park a few weeks ago. Um, just, I mean, you knew it was there. You, you knew all this was happening. You knew people were writing about these things and, and that, you know, Jonathan was kind of the connective tissue that like, brought everything together from food, culture, neighborhoods, everything. But just to see so many people in one place who believed in this potential of LA and had had these yeah. same experiences, who had eaten, I'm probably every single person there had, had eaten at the same restaurant as the person sitting next to them, at least one of them, right? And like, when does that ever happen where you have that shared feeling? Um, so for me, it was just sitting in the grass with my kids and just looking around and being like, this is the place I want to raise my children. Like, I, I feel a very part of this community and I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to start crying again. So. <laughs> this is really hard for me because as Alyssa knows, you know, I, I do walk through the city and I make a point of like just sometimes just driving to random neighborhoods um, that I haven't been in for a while or I haven't been to at all and I just park and I get out and I walk around and sometimes I take pictures or sometimes I actually end up having conversations with people. Yes, people talk to you. Um, and, 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 and I've gotten some really great stories out of it. Um, not journalism stories necessarily, but things that started to make me think. And one of the things, and this will go beyond the month, um, that I realized in doing this, in going out and in interacting with people is we're talking so much about how much change there is, but there is something when I sometimes I'll, I'll turn a corner and I'm like going, oh my God, so much has not changed. Mm -hmm. You know, the way, like the scale of a street or the way the neighbors are interacting, you know, over a fence or a cookout that happens and then several people come out and they join one another and I just think this place still has that neighborhood feeling, the thing where people will come together and tell stories. I know all my neighbors. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's, and I know when I tell this to people, they don't believe. I said, no, I know all their names. How many, here, how many people here say that they know all their neighbors? If you would raise yeah. My neighbors are here tonight. See, this is great. <laughs> good. We still have that. Yeah, they're, yeah. We they still all wave have in unison. that. They're all like, Jen's neighbors. So, yeah, I guess mm -hmm. it's like I want to temper that. Like, it's mm -hmm. like I'm thinking like, okay, whenever I'm going, oh, my God, it's all changing. It's all going away. No, it's not. And we will bring those stories, you know, to the next mm -hmm. generation and the next people that come in. Hopefully, you know, we can just, but we continue being ourselves. Yeah. My surprise is, uh, the biggest surprise I had uh, was also gentrification related. Um, um, my wife and I have revived this, uh, this really old tiny synagogue in Highland Park. And one of the ways we revived it, <laughs> represent. <laughs> All right. Um, but one of the ways we revived it was we had these, uh, these family uh, Friday night services, and we would get uh, pizza from this place called uh, Italiano's, and it was like $25 to get like a 32-slice uh, pizza. It was gigantic. <laughs> and uh, I stopped there. I, we haven't done it for a while, and I hadn't gone there recently, and I actually stopped by the place, and it had like a you know, Malta Vu or something like that was the new name of it. And I saw that a slice of pizza there, an individual slice was $10. Ah. So, um, so that was kind of my biggest that, surprise, surprise and, though. you know, and shock. Not a good one. In the last month. Surprises aren't all good. Not no. always. No. no. Yeah. I do think that LA is probably one big earthquake away from being affordable again. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, that's not what we're that banking I'm asking on, right? for that at all. I'm not I, asking for it. That's why we all kind of. Not at all. Not too big. Just a little. Just, just kind of big. Well, but one that of the is, things that brought us like, together as a city, so I say us, even though I wasn't here yet, was the 92 Northridge earthquake. Right. Was, is widely cited as being something that helped bring these disparate neighborhoods of really brought a co more cohesive or newly cohesive mm -hmm. Los Angeles identity because everybody pulled together and pizza got cheaper. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the 90s, it, it was crazy, and I was, I had just left the weekly, and I was starting at the time, and starting at the time, so 92 was the riots, 94 was the earthquake, then there were the fires, the flood, there was OJ, there was like, you know, I had gotten a call from the Washington Post and saying like, would you like to interview for a job as a culture critic? I'm like, why would I leave here? I mean, it's crazy, but that's... And it's like good stories everywhere you turn. But as Ed says, it's like it is part of this sort of like newsroom humor. Of like, like we was kind of going, yeah, another earthquake. Like that'll scare off the people who don't know, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. really. That'll and send those Brooklynites back real quick. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> real quick.